So I hope you gave the task that I gave you in our previous lesson a good go. Remember, I asked you to analyze this experiment. You are then required to write a report on the conclusions that you made about the relationship between momentum and velocity from the results of the experiment. I'm sure you'll agree that we should be able to check your answers by testing the amount of force required to stop the ball in each scenario. Do you think we could test the force using apparatus similar to those we used to test the force required to stop the heavy truck and the lighter passenger car? Let's check it out with Aaron in the lab. This time we keep the mass of the car constant at 250 grams. We change only its velocity. So I'm going to use the same vehicle, just let it hit with different velocities. First we measure the force as it strikes the barrier with a low velocity. And then we let it strike with a high velocity. Do you see that it takes much more force to stop the faster moving car than it does to stop the slower car? It would therefore seem that the car with a greater velocity has greater momentum. I'm sure you can agree with me that we can apply the same principle to the ball. That's why we required a thicker barrier to stop the ball in a task experiment. I hope that you came to similar conclusions in your report. It is important to note that the investigations we have done in this and the previous lesson only give us rough results because we don't know that the car stopped in exactly the same amount of time in each collision with the force sensor. What we have established from these experiments is that it seems to take more force to bring about change in the motion of a body with a large momentum. In today's lesson, we will investigate the factors that cause change in momentum in more detail. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how resultant force, time and change in momentum are related, define impulse and solve problems using these relationships. By now, it should be clear that a resultant force always causes a change in the momentum of a body. But have you thought about the direction in which the resultant force acts? If we want to increase momentum, we increase the velocity of the body by applying a resultant force in the same direction as its original velocity. To decrease momentum, the resultant force acts in the opposite direction to that of its original motion. Now the next obvious question we have to answer is how do we actually calculate a change in momentum? It is quite easy really. We subtract the initial momentum from the final momentum. The change in momentum is the final momentum minus the initial momentum. Let's apply this formula to the motion of a remote controlled car. The mass of the car is 0.25 kilograms. At first, the car is moving forwards with a velocity of plus 0.2 meters per second. The driver then accelerates the car to a velocity of plus 0.4 meters per second in the same direction of motion. What is the car's change in momentum? The change in momentum is the final momentum minus the initial momentum. The final momentum is the mass of the car, which is 0.25 kilograms times its final velocity, that is plus 0.4 meters per second forwards. Its initial momentum is 0.25 kilograms times its initial velocity of plus 0.2 meters per second forwards. So the change in momentum is 0.10 kilogram meters per second minus. 0.05 kilogram meters per second. Its change in momentum is plus 0.05 kilogram meters per second. This means the direction of change in momentum is forwards.
But remember, the final answer is given with the direction in words. 0,05 kilogram meters per second forwards. Notice that the resultant force that accelerated the car acts in the same direction as the change in momentum. Remember the truck on the highway we looked at in our previous lesson. Let's consider the change in momentum when the truck stops. The momentum of the truck changes from 90,000 kilogram meters per second to zero. The change in momentum is calculated as follows. The final momentum of the truck is zero. Subtract its initial momentum of 90,000 kilogram meters per second. The change in momentum is negative 90,000 kilogram meters per second. What does the negative sign tell us about this change in momentum? The change in momentum acts in the opposite direction to that of the original motion of the truck. It is in the same direction as the resultant force on the truck, that is, it opposes the truck's motion. For the rest of this lesson, I would like us to think about how resultant force, change in momentum and time are related to one another. To do this, I want us to look at the experiment with the ball and the pieces of cardboard again. Do you see that although the faster ball is not stopped by the cardboard, it does roll to a stop eventually? This means that the resultant force exerted by the cardboard did change the momentum of the ball, even if it did not stop it immediately. Now, if the slower ball, ball A, had an initial momentum of 0.5 kilogram meters per second, and the faster ball, B, had an initial momentum of 1 kilogram meters per second, and both these balls had a final velocity of zero, then you should agree that the change in momentum for ball A is smaller than the change in momentum of ball B. But the resultant force acting on both these balls was the same. We used exactly the same piece of cardboard. This must mean that change in momentum is not only dependent on the magnitude of the force. It seems that the length of time for which the force is applied also determines the change in momentum. Look, the faster moving ball is in contact with the cardboard for a longer period of time. So the same force had to be applied for a longer period of time to make the ball stop. This is a very important scientific concept. The change of momentum of a body can also be calculated by multiplying the resultant force by the time of contact between the two interacting bodies. This quantity is called the impulse on the body. So, impulse is the quantitative term for change in momentum. Impulse is a vector quantity, so we must always specify its magnitude or size and its direction. And since force is measured in newtons and time in seconds, the SI unit for impulse are newton seconds. It seems that we somehow instinctively understand this relationship between time, momentum and resultant force. We intuitively know ways of cushioning the blows and lessening the resultant forces that act on us. For example, we bend our knees on landing so that it takes a longer time for our velocity and therefore our momentum to change back to zero. In a similar way, when a netball player pulls her hands back towards her body on catching the ball, she is also buying time while she stops the ball from moving. She is taking a little longer to change its momentum back to zero. What is amazing about this is that although most people know how to break their fall, few know the physics and reasoning that backs up their actions. So let's cement our understanding of the connection between impulse and change in momentum by calculating the impulse as well as the change in momentum on the netball when a player catches it. The netball player catches a ball of mass 0.5 kilograms, traveling at 20 meters per second. Its initial momentum is 10 kilogram meters per second. She stops it dead, so its final momentum is zero. The ball's change in momentum is minus 10 kilograms meters per second or 10 kilograms meters per second away from her. Now if we know that the resultant force on the ball is 200 newtons away from the player and the time taken for the ball to slow down from 20 meters per second towards her to zero is 0.05 seconds, we can also calculate the impulse on the netball by using the formula 
change in momentum equals force times time. The impulse on the ball is therefore its resultant force times the time for which the force is exerted. It is 200 newtons times 0.05 seconds. This gives us an answer of 10 kilogram meters per second away from the player. And this is no coincidence. The change in momentum of the ball is the same as the impulse on the ball. This concept has quite an interesting implication. It doesn't matter how the player catches the ball. Its change in momentum is the same, from 10 kilogram meters per second towards her to 10 kilogram meters per second away from her. The change in momentum is fixed and so the impulse on the body is fixed. However, she can reduce the resultant force on her hands by taking time to pull them back towards herself. From this observation, we can conclude that the resultant force acting on a body and the time that the resultant force is applied are inversely proportional to one another. But more about this relationship in our next lesson. Now it is time for your task for today. Your task is to calculate the impulse on a swimmer when she pushes off from the side of the wall with an average force of 100 newtons for 1,3 seconds as she turns. She has a mass of 65 kilograms. With what maximum speed does she leave the wall? Discuss whether it is possible for her to increase the impulse on the wall by extending the time of contact during the turn. Join me for our next lesson when we delve even deeper into the relationship between resultant force, time and change in momentum. Yeah.